Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Shivangi Valke. I'm the founder of Thrive with Mentoring. Thrivewithmentoring.com is the website. And I'm joined here by Deepa Narayan, the author of the revolutionary book, Chup. Um, I have come across Deepa recently and I'm amazed with, uh, you know, your, your prolific writing, really, Deepa. And also that you have, you know, have had a career with the likes of UN and World Bank for more than 25 years now. Uh, probably a lot of you already know Deepa, but Deepa, we would like to know in your own words, maybe a little bit about you and your career before we start speaking about Chuk. Thank you. Uh, delighted to be here. I have a PhD in psychology, anthropology, sociology, but I worked all my life engineers and economists. I was senior advisor in the World Bank, uh, helping formulate poverty policies as if people mattered. So really my most famous book was called Voices of the Poor, looking at poverty from poor people's perspectives. Right. And so I've spent a lifetime looking at empowerment issues and how we can empower people in different fields, different walks of life. Great, great. And what what was the starting point for you, Deepa, for Chup? You know, and what are the sort of myths that Chup is now breaking? Um, after the Nirbhaya rape, I asked myself the question. Uh, I'm from Delhi, which is, what is it about our culture that leads to both rape and deep gender inequality? Mm -hmm. And I explored that cultural question through one question, which is, what does it mean to be a good man or a good woman today? Mm -hmm. And that one question then led to hundreds of questions, because what I found and that what I'll talk to you about is that the power of culture is very deep and goes much deeper than the power of the intellect trying to break it. And so the book really is about this gap between how we think about ourselves and mm -hmm. our aspirations and how we want to be or think we want to be and how we actually behave in everyday life. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fascinating, right? I mean, as a student of uh, organizational behavior and psychology myself, I have always been fascinated by what we want to be or what we believe we are as compared to how people might experience us or also our inner selves right and you spoke very you speak very well in this book around these you know seven bad habits uh, that even feminists can have and also women across the world can have perpetuated you know via different cultures in different ways for sure uh, and though your book research was mainly in india you have seen a a lot of the same themes you write uh, also in America, right? What what are these seven bad habits? Can you speak a little bit to them? I think uh, before I talk about the habits, what's important about the habits is to understand that they're linked to something deeper, which results in the persistence of gender inequality all over the world, despite all our efforts. And right. that is that especially in India, and it may be true of other places, that girls are still being trained not to exist or to behave in ways that diminish, discount, and shrinks themselves. And so women without a self, if you grow up, you if you don't have a self, you don't. there's no way you can have confidence in yourself. Yeah. But the real reason for the persistence, because you can have training and confidence, is that the... Uh, non-existent behavior or the instincts to shrink mm -hmm. is overlaid with morality, is yeah. overlaid with a sense of goodness. So that's what leads to the gap between the intellect and the behavior because we're trained very early in being good, even though as adults we may rebel against it. And it's this notion of being virtuous or good that really comes in the way of women living their lives fully in the ways they choose. Mm, yeah. So that was a long uh, yeah. prologue. So the seven habits that then diminish or discount or shrink women are the following. The first is uh, that uh, women are not meant to have bodies. So if you accept the proposition that you're not supposed to exist, how can you have a body? So there's a huge pretense that girls don't have bodies, 
So even today, in most middle class and upper class families, and I know this is true for the poor families as well, that there's no discussion around women's girls' bodies. Mm. So if a girl's body does not exist, if there's silence about it, and the pretense is that it doesn't exist, then bad things can't happen to the body. If yeah. bad things happen to the body, you cannot talk about it. Mm-hmm. And if you cannot talk about it, the girls who break that silence are then blamed because actually if something happens to the body, then it's your fault. Yeah. So this gap, this huge, terrifying statistics that you see on molestation and rape and sexual violence, not just in India, across the world, goes back to this denial that a girl's body is sexual, it exists, and so it needs to be talked about and accepted as uh, as we grow up. So in my study, I found that about 90% of the girls, uh, women, had been uh, molested, by which I mean touched inappropriately. But except for two, nobody had even told their parents about it. So yeah. in that way, we perpetuate the silence because we're all told that's that's what a good person does and we're very unconscious of this sort of behavior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fascinating Dupa, how you are relating, you know, the virtue and morality with some of these things that we grow that are so deep within that they manifest themselves maybe in ways that we are not aware of ourselves, right? That's That's fascinating. So I use the term uh, in the book that we may be feminists with bad habits. Feminists with bad habits. That's very hard hitting. Yes. Yes. Uh, The second is uh, voice. That girls are taught, uh, we have a biological advantage as we start growing up, but girls are taught not to speak. So mothers often say, uh, speak quietly. In fact, the word chup, is no longer a Hindi word. It's entered the English Oxford Dictionary because it's used so often. Mm. So from these little things in childhood of don't speak, speak softly, uh, keep quiet, your opinion isn't important, girls grow up to, uh, they lose their voice very simply. And without a voice, I mean, having a voice is so fundamental to being human to exist that it, so also diminishes women. And so there's this conflict between, should I speak up? Should I keep quiet? Maybe nobody will listen. Maybe people will laugh. What if I make a mistake? So that, of course, affects self-confidence. And at the workplace, it's quite deadly because it's not just that women are afraid to speak up, but the environment also puts women down when they do speak up, even by men who believe in gender uh, equality. So all of us, internalize these notions of how a good woman should behave and so obviously there is this classic study that you have probably come across also deepa which talks about the double bind for women it's like you know we need to be like goldilocks right anything too much too little is not good too much is not good and whatever we do i mean for instance the same qualities and research proves it time and again this exact same qualities in a man and a woman. In a man, it would be considered to be leadership qualities. In a woman, there's associated with aggression, bitchiness, bossiness, you know, and all of those kind of things. Exactly. And that's very universal. What's interesting is all the, my study I focused on India and modern women in the metros, in the large cities, who are educated, talented, working. The backup literature, and you'll find this all in the references, is all American. Right. So yeah. you're absolutely right that many of these habits are pervasive in many cultures. How strong they are varies, and mm-hmm. how they show up varies as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the we have one. I... Body, no body, no voice. Yes. What? What is the voice? Now you already, the silence is uh, going across in uh, different ways. The third one I talk about is pleasing behavior. Girls are taught to smile. And I think this is the most dangerous one, not because pleasing is not important, but pleasing in a compulsive way that's expected out of women. Women are expected to be nice, please, smile, but not laugh. That's a very interesting thing. When you smile, you're pleasing others. When you laugh, you're coming back to yourself. And so the tension is back to yourself. So women get punished or are called witches if they laugh loudly or freely. 
And so this pleasing behavior in the Indian context, it goes into the phrase of adjust, adjust karlo. It's the girl or the woman who has to be giving and who has to change how she is, what she wants to do to always be pleasing or thinking about others. Women defined it as my life purpose is to uh, make others happy or I'm a blender. So if you're a blender, it helps if you don't have strong preferences, right? If you're not clear about your desires, if you don't have strong opinions, if you're afraid to speak up, all these things come together to keep reinforcing these behaviors or these habits. And because these habits are intertwined, it makes it very difficult to pull them apart, which is why it's important to understand it may be a small behavior, innocuous or even virtuous, but actually it's very harmful. So one of the things women often say is it doesn't matter. Let it go. Yeah, that's fine sometimes but if that's your only behavior or that's the dominant behavior then women tend to get ignored um and then that's obviously problematic yeah, yeah. you've reminded me of a very interesting uh, comment and you know i at least my friends they really know i can laugh really loudly and i do and and they, my mom used to definitely say that to me saying oh i can hear your laughter downstairs and it was not meant as a compliment <laughs> so yeah. It, it's yeah. interesting, right? Because it would seem, I must say that she did not instill, you know, a feeling of guilt or anything, but she made me really aware that you laugh really loud. Right. You become conscious, yeah. right? I become conscious of that. And that yeah. often, you know, can be something that uh, you can ignore then, or then you try to, like you said, change your behavior. You try right. to adjust. You start, I say that girls become self-censoring and self-monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, devices, then you don't need the external world to say something because you're already deleting and editing yourself even before you speak up. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the fourth one is I talk about uh, sexuality, denial of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly there's more overt sexual behavior. Yeah. But given that there's no conversation around women's bodies, at least in Indian homes, yeah. uh, and no education on sexuality, so it's actually worse than with uh, our generation, because on the one hand, you're supposed to be sexually free. On the other hand, you're told to please and you're not supposed to be saying no to anyone. So there's a lot of distress, I would say, around these issues, although every woman, including the poor women, say, said that women have a right to sexual desire. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of shifts. But the fundamental shifts in women owning their own bodies and owning their desire and being able to express their desire is still conflicted because of this dilemma that you can't speak. You can't speak to your parent. You can't even own it. Most women don't even talk to it about uh, sexual activity with their friends. But so what is this, you know, how does the sexual freedom in today's life in the modern, you know, Indian woman's life, how does it manifest? Because if you look at it, all the other things that you said, they're so linked to that freedom piece, you know, how, yeah. how does then sexual freedom itself manifest today? What, what forms? I, think one of the shop, I mean, even in high schools, just about everyone has a boyfriend, mm -hmm. even in small towns. So that's accepted. Going out, talking about your boyfriend, having a boyfriend is accepted, even though parents may not know about it. So that's the dilemma. You have the secret life that's outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, TV and movies are very overtly sexual. But inside the home, there's silence. That's, that's a huge dilemma. So then there is obviously some guilt involved around sexual activity. Yeah. The second is that... Uh, that given the statistics on sexual molestation and the absence of sexual education, education on healthy sexuality, sexual encounters be can become quite problematic. And that's the area that we really need to speak about. So a girl who's been sexually molested or raped or harassed, as she grows up, her sexuality, her body has that trauma. And so the sexual activity and your relationships with men or your trust in men is deeply affected. Definitely. And this whole concept of... That's not very... I think that... I think that... 
education, education to what does two consenting adults, what does that even mean? I think that we are really far away from understanding that. It's very complicated and complex, and the conversation uh, is just starting yeah. in this whole area. Uh, the next one I talk about is social isolation, in which I talk about, especially focus on women's relationships with women. Mm -hmm. And this one was the biggest shocker to me, that girls and women, we seem to have been trained not to trust women mm -hmm. and not to trust each other. It's a sense of, and if you think about it culturally, it makes perfect sense, because if women unite, then the entire cultural system would be forced to change. So it serves the cultural status quo for women to pull other women down and be bitchy or mean or competitive. Because if women came together, then the entire cultural system would have to shift. This and is so again, Deepa is uh, high, of high interest to me, as you can imagine, because Thrive with Mentoring is actually trying to do that. We are trying to bring. Uh, you know, senior, more experienced women with, uh, you know, in, in connection with younger emerging leaders and helping, you know, that, that, that whole mentoring relationship is about a senior woman supporting in knowledge, life experience, you know, everything, the younger woman. But interestingly, it is bringing women together and uniting women together. And I get questioned a lot about, you know, why is this only for women? And, you know, are you not alienating the male population? And I have no such intentions. The challenge is that we do need, and I have noticed that I have launched now Thrive in many different cities, both in the developed and developing part of the world. And what I have seen is that the community that we create during that launch event, the energy that is there, the safety that is there, that is all something that, you know, that the women are really appreciating and that then bonds them, right? So your point yeah. around the social isolation is very interesting because at least with Thrive, I've noticed that the women want to be generous, you know, Thrive is a nonprofit, so the mentors are not getting paid for working right. with mentees for one full year on a regular, on a monthly basis. And I have now hundreds of women across the world coming and offering their generosity, right? So it's interesting, in a way, you speak about social isolation. At the same time, I see that women have deep within them this need to support other women and, you know, to be generous. I think, the, I, I think this forum that you're creating is totally invaluable for this reason, if for no other reason. Yeah. But then I think it's important that you speak explicitly about these issues of lack of trust because women we're very good at compartmentalizing our behavior mm -hmm. so the same woman may be fighting for women's rights and be a very strong feminist and doing great work but within her own family and her own circle of friends the old behaviors of lack of trust can come up so what i would suggest is you talk very explicitly because it comes back to relationships and i in this book i talk about it and it comes up over and over again that how we behave is context specific. And unless we talk about our own behaviors without shame, because if you say it's not a personal behavior, you've been trained to behave this way, then there's a much greater uh, chance of women being honest, which is what happened when we interviewed. I had no idea all this would come up, but I just created a safe environment. Right. And uh, because they weren't in relationship with me, they spoke about this. So just to give you one statistic uh, that emerged in this, we had, we explored the issue of female bosses. Yeah. I've been a female boss, but uh, two thirds of the women, and this includes strong feminists, did not want to work with a female boss. That does not bode well. Women don't belong to women's groups. That does not bode well. And women would laugh and said, we don't want to gossip. Mm -hmm. So these are all old ways in which we've held ourselves and each other down, which I think a group like yours has a very, very important role to play in breaking down these barriers. So we not only experience generosity when they are with you, but they take it out into the world, into their workplaces, into their own families, into their mm -hmm. friendships. 
with the family thing that's fascinating i recently was speaking to a 35 year old woman doing very well for herself indian origin living in switzerland for many years and an it manager in uh, you know in a mid sized company doing very well yeah, you know having a much larger team of men and women supporting to her most of them are older to her and she said yeah but i'm not just like that you know at home i am the very ideal babu and i found that fascinating because somehow it comes back to virtue right so she says i'm all of this you spoke about compartmentalization but she feels good that at home she is a completely different version of the ideal babu you know who makes rotis and who is who is going to you know get up very early in the morning make all the food for the children before going to her a fancy job if you might you know think of it that way and it's so internalized that having those both identities that's considered by women like this as a sign of virtue right exactly so women not all women are buying into this so women call it double duty and actually dread marriage and it raises the expectations for both in women but also men men mm. point out for examples and i'm talking about young educated men in it in computer science finance and business then well if aparna who is 32 can do this and who's been doing it for 12 years and has never complained and has two kids at home and goes and then they give read out a schedule then mm. this is the kind of wife i want mm. so there are double standards and uh, there is no right or wrong but we need to become aware and basically this double duty after a point you know is killing women mm. and late in life as you talk to older women they start resenting it and there's bitterness because there really isn't much appreciation uh, deep down in this being on alert all the time be on alert and you touch also that this um i i i seem to have either heard or read about depression as a theme emerging in that you know maybe post 50 uh age of women right this is when they are empty nesters the children have left they probably have sacrificed their career you know not risen to the same extent and now they are finding a way to live with their usually absent husbands maybe now more present and depression and mental health as it is is another taboo topic that we have in india did you come across with some of those themes also relate around depression or mental health linked to these habits that we are speaking about absolutely in fact this depression piece came across habits so i really didn't know where to put it and i've put it under pleasing okay. because i'm pleasing your i could talk about women are really supposed to be the emotional experts but they encourage to deny their own emotions and when you bottle up emotions it's got to come out somewhere and women implode and the depression numbers in india are quite high but in again in my study i found that no woman had been treated for depression and a couple of women found help on youtube and brought themselves out of it in about 5 years but it's not just only the empty nesters the other big period of uh, depression when depression hits is when the children are born and women start feeling trapped and uh, they're supposed to be wonderful mothers and there's no one they can talk about uh, they, there's nobody around whom they can talk talk with these issues so putting this whole business of motherhood on a very very high pedestal combined with the notions of constantly being perfect constantly being on the lookout to help others is really women say they are being killed by expectations mm. others expectations and their own expectations so it's it's easy to say we can break it but because it's linked to this notions of uh, goodness it becomes very complicated so sure, so sure. fascinating yeah it charted what what are the remaining couple of habits uh, that you have? Uh, at the last two i talk about uh, a clash between duty and desire which is sort of don't have a strong independent identity mm-hmm. and the last one is dependency and if you think about it all the other habits breed a sense of dependency and it's because your notion of being dependent so i have interviewed women who are ceos and um, have no difficulty going into a boardroom and speaking but in their personal relationships 
they say, I'm so timid, you won't recognize me. Mm. And so it's what we were talking about earlier is being the fierce leader outside and coming home and uh, being playing very, not traditional, but acting in a completely different way, acting meek, not speaking up and holding the peace no well, matter what. Yes, yes. Trying to stay away from conflict, trying to stay away from all of those badges that we want, we don't want, right, as women, because they're so good. Right, exactly. So in terms of mentoring, for example, if you just took one habit and looked at the consequences that of pleasing is that women avoid conflict, women are afraid to negotiate. In fact, they consider negotiation bad and uh, don't afraid to take risks. They don't initiate. And because they're not supposed to have strong preferences, decision-making becomes difficult. If sure. all this is true and you're hiding it all, how can you really uh, advance easily or be happy? whatever it is you're doing and especially in the work environment or in your own in entrepreneurship uh, it shows up in the numbers definitely and and as you said all of these are so intertwined right i mean how does one even delineate them how does one even say because if i look at the seven habits i might say you know these five don't apply to me these two do but these two then manifest themselves differently if I were, let's say, a mentor with Thrive, and I'm now, you know, thanks to your gift of Chuk, now more aware of what these habits are, how do we start the process of breaking through some of these habits? Are there some places which are more easier to begin with? I mean, awareness definitely is the first step. But what after that, Deepa? What would you after recommend? After that, it's dismantling, uh, a, a dismantling behavior. So it always has to come back to behaviors, how a person actually behaves. So, for example, women often said, in fact, I did a lot many interviews, including with uh, women of Indian backgrounds in the U.S., because women, even in high positions, said they have difficulty speaking, speaking up. Yes. The bosses are speaking up at meeting. So then you start with whatever the issue is. You start with, you use that as the entry point mm -hmm. in what happens when you want to speak up. Why do you not understand that question? So, for example, I interviewed someone in New York who's a head of a large organization. Yeah. And she defers, a head of a department in a large organization, and she uh, defers to her boss and won't go in and talk to her boss about problems with the project because she doesn't want to disturb him. Mm -hmm. So very concretely, it comes back to her notions of deference to men that she's not important enough to interfere or interrupt his work. Mm -hmm. And she's losing contracts because she's waiting to call him. And But she defines this behavior as aggressive. So intellectually, she knows she should shift, but she's unable to change her behavior. So if you see that sort of a behavior as a mentor, you have to be very, very non-judgmental and help a woman untangle and see, lay this behavior out and then go back and say, okay, what does it really mean to be uh, respectful? It actually goes back to respect as we taught that to be respectful is not questioning what our elders do and especially not questioning what men do. So it mm -hmm. links back, no matter where you enter, you're going to end up with all these habits, but start yeah. with the issue that's relevant to the woman that you're speaking with supporting great great well, can i just say one more, one more thing what we found is that in any relationship especially in a mentoring relationship that the mentors should also be uh, prepared to be emotionally affected because it will also bring up issues among themselves among mm -hmm. uh, among them so it's a very powerful way of changing and growing uh, together Definitely. And that's what we have seen, right? Even though in the beginning we say mentors, this is, you know, you are giving and the mentee is receiving. A lot of the mentors always, you know, come back to me and say, yes, you know, that's how I initially went into the relationship. But now with the quality of conversations we are having, the openness, the trust, the safety we have created in this one-on-one -on -one relationship, I feel as if I'm also gaining a lot. And this gain can come in many different ways. Like you said, one of them might be just that mirror that they're trying to hold towards that other person 
to help yeah. them develop, you know, maybe that mirror they also start holding towards themselves yeah. and start yeah. seeing how maybe some of the things that they had not seen within themselves are manifesting in this, you know, in this more younger mentee typically. Exactly. So that's I fascinating. Cover of the book. Here yes. it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely, uh, you know, very, very well depicted. Um, right. And it is my hope to see how Thrive with Mentoring and Chup can collaborate in more ways. I'm, I feel really that, um, you know, this, this is a revolutionary book. It gives us, uh, you know, with the modern Indian woman as a focus, but so many themes that are relevant across the gender agenda in many different organizations and many different countries and many different cultures. And I really like that you have said that culture is so deep that everything else that we try to build around it, it gets actually discounted because the cultural shifts have not happened yet. One last question for you, Deepa. One piece of advice that you would like to leave with Thrive mentors or mentees, which are women in this case, but women and men in general, what would you like to leave as a piece of advice? That you're not alone. That every, and these habits are not personal. So every woman I spoke to thought she was alone. They said they're afraid that this is too big a problem for them to change alone. But the habits are not personal. And the moment you realize they're not personal, you're not, it's not your fault that you're the, you are the way you are, which gives you huge freedom then to change rather than sit in pretense or sit feeling that you have to, uh, block the things and deny the things that are not working in your life. So we're in this together and we need to take the shame out of our behaviors so that we can have honest conversations, women with women and men with men, and then men and women together. Because unless men shift uh, and women shift together, we're going to have, we have to create a new world that works for all. And a current culture, uh, has a huge human cost, a human toll, both for men as well as for women. And obviously women have it worse because yes. it's women who are being assaulted in different ways. And obviously there is, the men have two problems too. So we need deep empathy, honesty, and then we need to shift. We need to change. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deepa. This has been really insightful. I look forward to a continuous collaboration with you and see how we can bring these messages, you know, to more and more women and help them to help themselves. Really, thank you very that's much. You started a fantastic program that's so needed in the world. So thank, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Have a very nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.